Welcome to the Folktale Project, this is Dan Scholes. Today we're starting a brand new tale from the Blue Fairy Book. It's a story that you may know already. It's the first part in Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels, A Voyage to Lilliput. My father had a small estate in Nottinghamshire, and I was the third of four sons. He sent me to Cambridge at fourteen years old, and after studying there three years I was bound apprentice to Mr. Bates, a famous surgeon in London. There, as my father now and then sent me small sums of money, I spent them in learning navigation and other arts useful to those who travel, as I always believed it would be some time or other my fortune to do. Three years after my leaving him, my good master, Mr. Bates, recommended me as ship's surgeon on the Swallow, on which I voyaged three years. When I came back, I settled in London, and having taken part of a small house, I married Miss Mary Burton, daughter of Mr. Edmund Burton, Hoosier. But my good master Bates died two years after, and, as I had few friends, my business began to fail, and I determined to go again to sea. After several voyages, I accepted an offer from Captain W. Pritchard, master of the Antelope, who was making a voyage to the South Sea. We set sail from Bristol, May 4th, 1699, and our voyage at first was very prosperous. But in our passage to the East Indies, we were driven by a violent storm to the northwest of Van Diemen's Land. Twelve of our crew died from hard labor and bad food, and the rest were in a very weak condition. On the 5th of November, the weather being very hazy, the seamen spied a rock within 120 yards of the ship, but the wind was so strong that we were driven straight upon it and immediately split. Six of the crew, of whom I was one, letting down the boat, got clear of the ship, and we rowed about three leagues till we could work no longer. We therefore trusted ourselves to the mercy of the waves, and, in about half an hour, the boat was upset by a sudden squall. What became of my companions in the boat, or those who escaped on the rock, or were left in the vessel, I cannot tell. But I conclude they were all lost. For my part, I swam as fortune directed me, and was pushed forward by wind and tide. But when I was able to struggle no longer, I found myself within my depth. By this time, the storm was much abated. I reached the shore at last about eight o'clock in the evening, and advanced nearly half a mile inland, but could not discover any sign of inhabitants. I was extremely tired, and with the heat of the weather I found myself much inclined to sleep. I lay down on the grass, which was very short and very soft, and slept sounder than ever I did in my life for about nine hours. When I woke, it was just daylight. I attempted to rise, but could not, for as I happened to be lying on my back, I found my arms and legs were fastened on each side to the ground, and my hair, which was very long and thick, tied down in the same manner. I could only look upwards. The sun began to grow hot, and the light hurt my eyes. I heard a confused noise about me, but could see nothing except the sky. In a little time I felt something alive moving on my left leg, which, advancing gently over my breast, came almost up to my chin, when, bending my eyes downward, I perceived it to be a human creature, not six inches high, with a bow and arrow in his hands and a quiver at his back. In the meantime, I felt at least forty more following the first. I was in the utmost astonishment, and roared so loud that they all ran back in a fright, and some of them were hurt with the falls they got by leaping from my sides upon the ground. However, they soon returned, and one of them, who ventured so far as to get a full sight of my face, lifted up his hands in admiration. I lay all this while in great uneasiness, but at length, struggling to get loose, I succeeded in breaking the strings that fastened my left arm to the ground, and, at the same time, with a violent pull that gave me extreme pain, I a little loosened the strings that tied down my hair, so that I was just able to turn my head about two inches. But the creatures ran off a second time before I could seize them, whereupon there was a great shout, and in an instant I felt above a hundred arrows discharged on my left hand, which pricked me like so many needles. Moreover, they shot another flight into the air, of which some fell on my face, 
which I immediately covered with my left hand. When the shower of arrows was over, I groaned with grief and pain, and then, striving again to get loose, they discharged another flight of arrows larger than the first, and some of them tried to stab me with their spears, but by good luck I had on a leather jacket which they could not pierce. By this time I thought it most prudent to lie still till night, when, my left hand being already loose, I could easily free myself. And as for the inhabitants, I thought I might be a match for the greatest army they could bring against me if they were all the same size with him I saw. When the people observed that I was quiet, they discharged no more arrows. But by the noise I heard, I knew that their number was increased, and about four yards from me, for more than an hour, there was a knocking like people at work. Then, turning my head that way as well as the pegs and strings would let me, I saw a stage set up about a foot and a half from the ground with two or three ladders to mount it. From this, one of them, who seemed to be a person of quality, made me a long speech of which I could not understand a word, though I could tell from his manner that he sometimes threatened me and sometimes spoke with pity and kindness. I answered in few words, but in the most submissive manner, and, being almost famished with hunger, I could not help showing my impatience by putting my finger frequently to my mouth to signify that I wanted food. He understood me very well, and descending from the stage commanded that several ladders should be set against my sides, on which more than a hundred of the inhabitants mounted and walked towards my mouth with baskets full of food, which had been sent by the king's orders when he first received tidings of me. There were legs and shoulders like mutton, but smaller than the wings of a lark. I ate them two or three at a mouthful, and took three loaves at a time. They supplied me as fast as they could with a thousand marks of wonder at my appetite. I then made a sign that I wanted something to drink. They guessed that a small quantity would not suffice me, and, being a most ingenious people, they slung up one of their largest hogsheads and rolled it towards my hand and beat out the top. I drank it off at a draught, which I might well do, for it did not hold half a pint. They brought me a second hogshead, which I drank and made signs for more, but they had none to give me. However, I could not wonder enough at the daring of these tiny mortals who ventured to mount and walk upon my body while one of my hands was free without trembling at the very sight of so huge a creature as I must have seemed to them. After some time there appeared before me a person of high rank from his imperial majesty. His Excellency, having mounted my right leg, advanced to my face with about a dozen of his retinue and spoke about ten minutes, often pointing forwards, which, as I afterwards found, was toward the capital city, about a half-mile distant, whither it was commanded by His Majesty that I should be conveyed. I made a sign with my hand that was loose, putting it to the other, but over His Excellency's head for fear of hurting him or his train, to show that I desired my liberty. He seemed to understand me well enough, for he shook his head, though he made other signs to let me know that I might have meat and drink enough and very good treatment. Then I once more thought of attempting to escape, but when I felt the smart of their arrows on my face and hands, which were all in blisters, and observed likewise that the number of my enemies increased, I gave tokens to let them know that they might do with me as they pleased. Then they daubed my face and hands with a sweet-smelling ointment, which in a few minutes removed all the smart of the arrows. The relief from pain and hunger made me drowsy, and presently I fell asleep. I slept about eight hours, as I was told afterwards, and it was no wonder, for the physicians, by the emperor's order, had mingled a sleeping draught in the hogshead of wine. It seems that, when I was discovered sleeping on the ground after my landing, the emperor had early notice of it, and determined that I should be tied in the manner I have related, which was done in the night while I slept. That plenty of meat and drink should be sent me, and a machine prepared to carry me to the capital city. Five hundred carpenters and engineers were immediately set to work to prepare the engine. It was a frame of wood, raised three inches from the ground, about seven feet long and four wide, moving upon twenty-two wheels. But the difficulty was to place me upon it. Eighty poles were erected for this purpose, and very strong cords fastened to bandages which the workmen had tied around my neck, hands, body, and legs. Nine hundred of the strongest men were employed to draw up these cords by pulleys fastened on the poles, and in less than three hours I was raised and slung into the engine and there tied fast. Fifteen hundred of the emperor's largest horses, each about four inches and a half high, were then employed to draw me towards the capital. But while all this was done, I still lay in a deep sleep, 
and I did not wake till four hours after we began our journey. The emperor and all his court came out to meet us when we reached the capital, but his great officials would not suffer his majesty to risk his person by mounting on my body. Where the carriage stopped, there stood an ancient temple supposed to be the largest in the whole kingdom, and here it was determined that I should lodge. Near the great gate through which I could easily creep, they fixed ninety-one chains like those which hang to a lady's watch, which were locked to my left leg with thirty-six padlocks. And when the workmen found it was impossible for me to break loose, they cut all the strings that bound me. Then I rose up, feeling as melancholy as ever I did in my life. But the noise and astonishment of the people on seeing me rise and walk were inexpressible. The chains that held my left leg were about two yards long, and gave me not only freedom to walk backwards and forwards in a semicircle, but to creep in and lie at full length inside the temple. And that is chapter one of A Voyage to Lilliput. We shall see what happens to our young sailor in chapter two on Friday. This is Dan Scholes for the Folktale Project. Don't forget that you can subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, Overcast, anywhere you like to get your podcasts. You can follow us on Threads and Instagram at Folktale Project, and you can find us wherever you like to listen to your podcasts. As always, thank you so much for listening.